give you a five minute and two minute warning. And you can start whenever you're ready. Perfect. Well, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedules. It's been a great day of competition. And we're really excited to share with you our holistic plan for Little Gem Health as we work towards MAC implementation. My name is Emily Herman, this is Margaret Templeton, and this is Boop Hender Manhattan. But before we go into our recommendations, we first need to understand the current situation for both MACRA and our system as a whole. MACRA is a piece of 2015 legislation that moves towards value-based reimbursements for CMS under Medicare Part B. There are penalties for not participating in either the MIPS or APM tracks but there are incentives for high quality care. There are two tracks that healthcare organizations have to pick under MACRA, Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS, or Alternative Payment Model, or APM. Now there are a few things we also need to understand about our system as a whole before delving into these recommendations. We lost patients to our competitors, both at in inpatient and outpatient level, from fiscal year 2015 to 2016, which led to an operating loss of 16.67%. However, we still hold 41% of the market share. A couple other key points are that we have staffing issues as brought up by our physician group, and we have a manual quality reporting EMR. Which brings us to our quote today that we feel adequately <coughs> describes the situation that Little Jim Health finds itself in. And that is if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. Which brings us to our opportunity. What is our approach to MACRA, and how can we successfully implement it at Little Gem Health? To answer this question, we present the following agenda. First, we'll go over our vision for Little Gem Health. Next, we'll delve into our recommendations. Then we'll look at the impact of these recommendations, a risk analysis, and a conclusion. Our approach is as follows. We have a set of short-term recommendations. First, looking at the MIPS track from years one through four, then looking at peer partnerships, then working on aligning with our providers to address their concerns and also move towards better alignment. These feed into our long-term recommendations, which will be looking at the APM track in year five and beyond, upgrading our electronic medical record, and better aligning with the community network of physicians, leading to our ultimate vision, to be an innovative and sustainable healthcare leader giving high quality care to our community. So as we go into our recommendations, let's first look at the decision between MIPS and APM and what we recommend for Little Gem Health. To understand our recommendations, we need to go over the reimbursement model as presented by CMS. For the MIPS performance score, there are four categories that are used by CMS to determine what <coughs> level of incentive or penalty rate you will receive. Air quality, advancing care information, improvement activities, and cost starting in 2018. You can see on the right, the table shows the incentive and penalty rates under each option under MACRA. The purple column shows the MIPS incentive and penalty rates based on that performance score on the left, ranging from plus or minus 4% in 2017 up to plus, 20, plus or minus 9% in 2021. In contrast, the APM model has a consistent 5% incentive rate for the next five years, assuming that you qualify under the eligible APM models. We have found the cost of doing nothing for Little Gem Health would be over $125 million loss if we do not choose either the MIPS or APM tracks. Given that we do not currently operate as an eligible alternative payment model, we are recommending MIPS in year one. To do this, we recommend the following sets of activities. First, it is critical that we hire ambulatory quality improvement personnel at an executive level to ensure continuous quality improvement. In similarly situated organizations, we've found that this is absolutely critical for not only getting everybody to buy into the recommendations necessary for quality improvement, but also ensures that it becomes a priority for all in management. We then recommend it rolling in the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative movement under CMS Innovation Center. This is an initiative that provides support for organizations as they move from the MIPS track to the APM track. Finally, to ensure that we don't receive a negative reimbursement adjustment in 2019, we will report at least 90 days of data under group reporting in the CMS interface, so that instead of that negative 4% of 
adjustment in 2019, we instead get a positive 2% adjustment. In years two through four, we recommend a set of different activities to ensure that we are moving towards higher quality care for all of our patients. <coughs> we will continue our year one activities where we'll, we will report on a group reporting under CMS, but this time we will report full year's worth of data. We will also continue our work with TCPI. Then we'll be working towards an alternative payment model solution in year five. To do so, we will continue to work on quality improvement activities to ensure that our quality metrics are strong enough to support an APM. We will also prepare for next generation ACO requirements. To do so, we will then apply for the next generation ACO through CMS in year four so that we can begin reporting under the APM track in year five. Thus, in year five, we will report as a next generation ACO, <coughs> which will lead to many positive impacts for Little Gym Health, including higher quality care, potential for higher payment adjustments into the future, better reputation in our community, and an efficient EMR. In order to qualify for an APM in year five, we must look at internal and external shortfalls that may affect the advancement of our recommendation. One shortfall is our current EMR. As it states, it has manual reporting and inappropriately shifts the burden onto clinicians who would be better utilized seeing patients. As the CIO has expressed a desire to expand and upgrade the EMR, it is imperative that we have automated reporting and interoperability between internal and external networks. Three key features of this upgrade include automated solution, advancing clinical practices, and real-time performance data. By having real-time metrics, Little Gem Health will be able to drive continuous quality improvement initiatives based on these data. As the High Tech Act has passed, and that money to be granted money, the mo sorry, as the High Tech Act has passed, we will present other ways to be funded money for this essential investment. In B-City, B-City Blue Cross is 60% of the market, while Little Gem Health is the largest provider. Because of this, we would like to propose a mutually beneficial partnership that works towards the commitment of lower costs and higher quality of care. According to the NIH, from 2015 to 2016, there's been a 6% increase in these partnerships. For instance, in Illinois, Advocate Healthcare has, merged with Blue, has partnered with Blue Cross Blue Shield. This partnership works with a paper pay performance incentive and will work towards, in year three, a joint health plan. As new and exciting upgrades are happening internally and up, or partnerships are happening externally, we look to align and engage our provider networks. The three provider networks that we have are primary care, specialty, and the community network. As we know, primary care and specialty group are employed by the system while the community network has, is loosely affiliated. When comparing and contrasting services found in the community network that are not at Little Gem Health, we see key differences, specifically oncology, GI, and endocrinology. For Little Gem Health, it is important to have a continuum of care that meets all the needs of the patients. Because of this, we would like to affiliate with the community network. A managed service organization is our recommended affiliation. Because of this, the community network will be able to use our newly upgraded EMR, have interoperability between the system, and be aligned with our quality initiatives. Other provider alignment initiatives include looking at the compensation model between primary care and specialty group. For primary care, it's value-based compensation model, and the specialty group operates under work relative value units. As we want to slowly transition specialty to a value-based compensation model, we are proposing a minimal qual quality incentive on top of the current compensation model. In addition, staffing has been identified as a, staffing has been identified by providers to have uh, a need for more nurses uh, to help the providers. As we have updated our EMR, we believe that the shift of burden will change back over to scribes, nurses, LPNs, but we will look further into investigating if staffing needs to happen. In addition, there will be additional education for macro implementation and the alignment of all the community networks. 
As this alignment is forming and there is continued education, we believe that Little Gem Health can work towards an ACO in year five. Next, we're going to look at the impact of our recommendations. But before we begin, let's brief, briefly recap them. First, we're going to begin immediately with the implementation of MIPS, which involves hiring <coughs> regulatory quality improvement staff and reporting group data to CMS. Throughout these years, we will be participating in TCPI and be working towards a transformation into a next generation ACO, which is what we will report as in 2021. Our second recommendation was forming a partnership with B City Blue Cross. Negotiations will begin immediately and conclude in 2018 when we will start our paper performance contract. In 2019, we hope to move forward with a joint health plan product. We also mentioned aligning with our community network. These negotiations will begin once we have concluded negotiations with BCPC, and by 2019, we hope to move forward with an aligned network of providers. Another recommendation was upgrading our EMR. Planning for this upgrade will begin this year, implementation in 2018, and by 2019, we will have a fully functional EMR. And lastly, for 2017, we recommend educating our staff on the importance of MATRA, hiring additional support staff if deemed necessary, and adding a bonus to specialist pay. Moving forward, let's take a look at how these actions are going to affect our stakeholders. First, let's begin with the patients. By forming partnerships throughout the community and upgrading our EMR, we're going to be able to offer an increased range of services for our patients, and their health information will follow them because we will be coordinating their care. We will, using our performance feedback and focusing on continuous quality improvement, patients will have better health outcomes and know that they are receiving a superior quality of care. Lastly, we will also increase access for our patients by changing our workflows. Currently, some physicians have to room patients, take their vitals, and input this information into the EMR. This process is frustrating for our physicians. It creates inefficiencies, and it can lead to wait times. With our, rec with our recommendation of hiring additional support staff, a different provider, such as a nurse or an MA, would be able to conduct this initial visit and input this data into the EMR, allowing the physician to conduct more visits. This recommendation will lead to an increase in employee satisfaction and an additional 1,500 visits per physician per year. From the system's perspective, interoperability will increase patient well-being and increase pro uh, productivity. We will also increase our market share through our new partnership with B-City Blue Cross. We're going to have an increased employee satisfaction because we will keep physicians informed and involved and have addressed all of their concerns. And lastly, we will have a better reputation in the community because we will be providing a superior quality of care. Looking to our finances, you can see that the in in incremental increase in expenses remain steady at around $12 million per year. These expenses are primarily driven by AQI personnel, upgrading our EMR, hiring additional support staff, and adding the bonus to specialist pay. Our revenues, on the other hand, start at $0, but increase dramatically. These revenues are driven by the CMS incentives, our incentives from B-City Blue Cross, and clinical efficiencies leading to a higher patient volume. Our, invest, our recommendations do require an investment, but they will pay off. We will break even by 2019, and these recommendations have a value of $26.8 million. This is a conservative financial estimate, but we understand there are risks involved with any set of recommendations, which we have also considered. The first risk involves our partnership with BCBC, which we think will be successful for several reasons. As we mentioned, we've seen similar partnerships in the past. We're providing a high quality of care, and we're trying to reduce the total cost of care. If BCBC isn't interested, we can also pursue this option with other insurers in the area. Another risk is qualifying as an APM. We believe that instead of rushing to qualify, we're going to get knowledgeable people and do this right. And this is why we expect to take several years for the process of transforming into an ACO. Even if we don't qualify, we will still report under MIPS and receive positive adjustments. Our last risk it involves receiving these positive adjustments from CMS. We believe, based on our past performance on quality metrics and our focus on continually, continuous quality improvement, we will continue to receive positive adjustments. In summary, our, approach offer, our recommendations offer a holistic approach to the challenges that LGH faces today. Implementing our recommendations will ensure that the rate of change on the outside does not exceed the rate of change on the inside, and that LGH will provide value for all of our patients. Thank you. We'll answer any questions. Great, thanks. We will transition to five minutes of Q&A. You mentioned the um, bonus to specialist pay. Um, is it just a specialist or are you or are PCPs included in this? 
It's moving. Um, primary care physician is currently on a value-based compensation model, and specialties are operating under work RBU. So it's beginning a transition for them to operate under a value-based compensation model. So that's why they just have that minimal incentive on quality instead of just transitioning transitioning them directly over to the value-based compensation. So you're also going to have a vote. Correct. This is the initial approach. In similarly situated organizations, we found that some had moved more directly to that value-based compensation right away, and that led to physician revolt to be quite uh, blunt about that. So that was something that we thought was incredibly important to have that smooth transition, especially since we're making a lot of requests of our providers with our recommendations. So good job, guys. I thought you did a good job sort of explaining some of the impacts, and I appreciate that you started with the, the patients there. That was nice. Um, you, you highlighted it in uh, the session you were talking about the risks. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what happens if Blue Cross says no? Uh, and then alternatively, you, know, you had the quantification of the $6 million, I think. You know, how did you quantify the value you get out of that relationship? Uh, well, first of all, if BCD Blue Cross is not interested, we can also approach other insurers in the area. And this is why, initially, this is all going to be a negotiation to see what's the likelihood of this occurring. But because of our seeing these similar relationships grow in the past, we think we're going to be adding value to the community, and we think BCD Blue Cross would be interested in that relationship. And going to your question of how we quantified that, we estimated how many more patients we thought we would see due to this uh, partnership based on past information with other insurers. And we quantified how much money we would be able to get from those additional patients coming in. So the so they're the largest insurer, right? So mm -hmm. you get six million dollars from them. If you don't get that six million dollars, is this a negative financial outlook for your proposal? The second largest is the WASP insurance, and they're thirty percent of the market. So we would still break even in year three. And in, despite that, all of our recommend our financial analysis is very conservative. So despite having good quality care on a lot of our PQRS metrics, which we, will, we know will translate to a positive NIF score, we still will break even despite not having the BCBC partnership. So we adjusted our financials to have the most conservative outlook possible. Mm -hmm. So I have a quick question about your um, community network of physicians. So if I'm a community doc and I'm looking to more closely align with one of the big health systems, why am I going to choose to align with you as opposed to the other two systems in the city? So we purposely placed um, the partnership with BCBC prior to this, so just so that we could have all of our um, quality initiatives put forth uh, before we present this alignment. Uh, as our competitors are looking with clinics and operating and expanding, we thought that this would be a way to best align them. And they are already loosely affiliated with us, so this just attaches a title for them. It would allow them to use our updated EMR, have interoperability with us, as well as the quality metrics and continuous quality improvements that we would be doing. I'm building on that. Our financial estimates are based off of only getting a third of the community network to operate under the MSO, because we recognize that getting a physician group that large, getting everybody to buy in is unlikely. Mm -hmm. So we doing a conservative estimate again of a third will ensure that we can get at least some of the specialists on board with our entire physician groups. Nice job, I also think that, and I appreciated the, um, the slide you had on the EMR update. I think they were, they were well thought out. Can you talk a little bit about um, the impact of the quality reporting or perhaps more, more information on evidence-based medicine and how that's gonna play into yeah, so our system has already been reporting PQRS metrics in 2015, but it, there hasn't been a history of a strong value of ambulatory quality improvement. And similarly situated organizations have found that having ambulatory quality improvement staff at an executive level is something that's absolutely critical to ensure that these improvements are systematic and provide higher quality care. So we believe that having that staff in from the get-go in year one will ensure that positive uh, quality. We also think by instead of just working with macro but expanding it to our commercial payers as well, that really drives the incentive for our organization to ensure that quality outcomes is the most important thing that we can provide for our patients. Because if we just look at the public, that would just be a, a small portion of our 
uh, overall patient base. So by looking at value for all of our patients, we think that that will drive the incentives to improve the quality metrics. That's all the time we have. Thank you very much. Thank you.